Welcome to Network Engineering. This is Chapter 4, Part 1, where we take a look at routers and switches and begin to look at Layer 3 of the network stack. So there are generally two ways to look at networks and the technology that we use for communications. One of them is the local area network, or the LAN, and this is really designed for high speed and low latency type of ac um, activity. It's a small-ish area of size geographically and typically maybe one building or a small campus. So for example, here at the university, um, we have uh, one LAN uh, across campus. And if we were a little bit bigger, maybe we would need to start splitting that up a little bit. But um, you can almost also kind of look at it as the School of Engineering is its own LAN, and then we're another LAN within a larger local area network. Um, the one other way to look at a local area network or tell kind of how to characterize it is that the local area network is comprised only of the customer premises equipment or the things that we own and maintain. Most of this is going to be covered in, I guess, not actually chapter five, but chapter six, when we start looking at layer two of the network stack. The other major type of network is the wide area network. And the wide area network is designed for long haul remote connections. Often just because of cost, we're not going to lay our own phone lines or tele te telecommunication lines, but we're going to lease them from another communications provider. In the United States, that's most often the telephone company uh, or the cable company. So in our local region, you'd either be uh, renting them from Embark, I guess is who they are now. So no, CenturyLink. They've changed names. They used to be Sprint. Now they're whatever. Um, that's the what used to be the historic telephone utility. So they have a monopoly on the telephone lines. And then in this area, it's mostly Comcast, although there's Coonscom around here as well for some parts. They have the monopoly on the uh, underground uh, cable connections that go to people's houses. Um, we could also do things like satellite and stuff like that, or microwave even. Um, but for the most part, we're looking at long haul fiber between um, distant places. And the WAN is gonna have a kind of a, a broader presence and there will be a point where the WAN joins the local area network, and that's called the demarcation point, where everything kind of outside of the demark is the property and responsibility of the telephone company or the communications company, and everything on the other side of the demark is everything is responsible to the local customer. So when the guy with the backhoe digs up a fiber optic cable, we wanna know who has to pay to put the fiber optic cable back in. Um, and actually, now that I think about it, there's an old joke. If you've lost your fiber optic cable on your map, uh, how do you find it? Well, you give a guy a backhoe. Um, honestly, it, the people with backhoes, they seem to just have this uh, psychic ability to know where uh, fiber optic cables are under the ground. It's, it's uncanny. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of terms that they introduce here, um, one of which and you should be familiar with all of these. Um, the one we've already used is the customer premises equipment, and this is, the, again, the stuff that the customer owns and is responsible for. So, and you may even have experience with this already. So, for example, at home, I have Comcast for my home office provider, and Comcast tries to sell me um, the, the Doxis modem. I bought that myself. So that's now my, the D mark is from the wire coming into my house. Everything outside the wire is, is Comcast. After the wire inside my home is me. So uh, I own the modem, I own the router, I own all the, the data units. There is a channel service unit or a data services unit and this is kind of historical. This goes back to the days of having um, T1 or T3 lines, which are still kind of common for medium large places. Uh, cable services and some fiber optic services now have kind of offset those, but these services require a common clock 
because they're going to be doing time division multiplexing. So you get a fraction of a T1 or a fraction of a T3 uh, dedicated for your network connection. And we need to make sure that that fraction is you're transmitting and receiving data on your fraction. And so the CSU DSU is going to provide not only the connection, like the line card connection to your router, but it's also going to give that router the clock signal that it's going to use to be synchronized back to the central office. We've already talked about the DMARC. Uh, so the DMARC is again that uh, point of presence where uh, the provider stops and you take over. Um, the other two terms here, I kind of maybe had them out of the wrong order. They, they're kind of like defined in terms of each other. So the central office is the local area communications central office. So back in the old days, uh, this was the, actually the telephone switching office where the telephone switches would be installed. So uh, when you have a phone, like an old landline phone, the phone company never provided a direct connection to everybody's phone. Like you couldn't possibly have everybody in the world making a phone call, well, I guess half of the people making a phone call to the other half of the people at the same time. There's just not enough circuits in the long haul connections between switching offices. So the switching office would essentially be a multiplexer or a demultiplexer for a local area. Um, they also have the local loops for all of the communication lines that are used for a particular area. So the local loop gets me from say my campus to the central office or my business to the central office. From the switching office then, we'll, we'll get out to the kind of backbone lines that go between cities or go between um, regions or countries. Um, kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, forwarding, routing, and bridging. So the idea is if we're gonna have um, part of our net, whoops, don't go. I wanted my pen, I didn't get my pen. There's my pen. So if part of our network is gonna have our local devices, like our PCs connected to it, and they're gonna be connected to some kind of customer premises equipment, and eventually those are gonna be connected to some kind of WAN, which is then connected to a different customer premises equipment to say some remote web server. Um, what we want to be able to do, do is somehow deal with the PCs being able to talk to themselves. And that's going to be that LAN type of activity. That's going to be mostly layer two. Um, in our terminology, although we haven't really looked at layer two yet, uh, this would be the ethernet protocol. Now, certainly we're going we're gonna to treat many of the services locally as if they were remote IP services. But understand that the internet protocol was originally designed for those long haul wide area connections. And I'm going to want to have, I'm going to want to make a different distinction between things that are local and things that are remote. So for example, things that are local, if PC one is sending here to PC two, I want that traffic to stay on premises. I don't want that to go all the way out to the internet. At the same time, I want to make it relatively easy for a PC to send data to that server, and I guess equally importantly, have that server get results back. <laughs> so um, what we end up having to do here is treat the local area traffic a little bit different than we treat the wide area traffic. Ultimately, one's going to be handled through ethernet, and then the other one is going to be handled through a series of virtual pa uh, virtual um, packet or virtual circuits, sorry, over packet switching. So as we send little packets back and forth, we want to be able to uh, either forward those on to the next. Well, somehow we want to get them to the next machine. So that's our goal, right? So if that's our goal then what we really need to have here are um, ways for me to get my data out to that remote server and for that remote server to know how to get back to my PC. 
And the way we most often do this is with a technique called forwarding. In the case of forwarding, what we're going to do is when a packet arrives on a machine, so let's say I have a packet coming into this router. We'll use that term for now, it's fine. So that router gets this little packet and it says, mm, is this for me? And it says, nope, not for me. Um, is it for anybody I know about? Nope. Um, but I do know how to get to that next hop. So I'm gonna forward that packet out over to the next router. And that router is gonna say, is this for me? No, but I know how to get to the next hop. Um, finally, that router, hopefully, eventually, that packet is gonna get to another router that says, is this for me? Yes, it is actually for a network I know about. I'm gonna send that to one of Google's servers. And this is where it's gonna enter Google's local area network, and Google is gonna handle that packet however they've chosen to handle it. And when they put the response back, they're gonna tell the router, here is some data back for this PC. That router says, uh, I don't know how to handle that, but I know where it came from, so I'm gonna respond, respond back to here. And then this router is gonna say, oh, I, I know how to get back to that machine, and then I know how to get back to that PC, and so on and so forth. And that's the basic idea behind forwarding. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give my packet to the next router in the hopes that that router can get it eventually to another router that knows how to get it to the remote destination. And that's most often what we're gonna to come to call store and forward. And it's not hard to imagine why, right? So I send a packet to this router and it's gonna get that packet stored up into a memory buffer and as soon as it can, then it's gonna to try to send it out over that wire. So the other way that we can see forwarding is much more related to being on a local area network. And on a LAN, I might have a high-speed switch and I have a whole series of PCs and they are all connected to one another here through that switch. So they're not directly connected to each other but they are connected to uh, this, this switch. And if the switch is able to make a connection, so if this guy is sending data to this guy, the fastest, remember we said that a LAN has to be low latency. So to reduce the latency as the stream of bits leaves this, this guy here, I need to establish a virtual circuit or what we call a cut through switch and literally electrically connect the, the transmitter of that PC to the receiver of this other PC, bit by bit by bit. And that would be the cut through switching. The packet never gets stored, and uh, that connection gets dynamically established by the hardware of the switch. The two PCs just magically start talking to one another as fast as they can. And in effect, what we're trying to do is make it seem to these two PCs like they had some virtual network wire between them. And in fact, if you have a really nice high-end switch, while those two PCs are talking, these two PCs could also be talking. And again, they believe that there's this imaginary high-speed link between them, that they're directly connected to one another. The, the switch is able to just cut all of those machines through. There is an upper limit to how fast it can go, um, and it just depends on the quality of the switch. Um, I do know that when you hit that limit, bad things happen. Um, <laughs> uh, the story for another day. When we talk about layer two, we'll talk about switching again. All right, so that's forwarding, and forwarding can be part of switching or it can be part of routing. In the case of routing, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a piece of software that's going to decide whether or not to forward a received packet. So it kind of implies that we're gonna have store and forward. Why? Because I can't do cut through switching if I have to make a decision. Because if I started to do cut through switching and then I got like halfway through the frame, uh, I'd have to somehow like terminate that and, and, and undo the, the data that I've already sent. So as far as routing goes, we can't do that low latency cut through switching technique that we did on a local area network. So routing by definition is typically viewed as a WAN protocol. And we're gonna find that there's a, a series of 
uh, values that we can extract from a, a packet and the router can use that to make a decision. Should I forward? If so, where should I forward it to? And um, then it can carry that out. Or the router could just simply say, I'm not going to forward this data and drop it. But that does imply the existence of a rule table. And when you start saying about having a rule table, it also implies that there is some method to update that rule table. In other words, we need a way to control what rules go into each router. And that becomes the subject of the next chapter when we talk about the control plane idea of routing, where we actually look at some routing protocols like RIP or OSPF to update and propagate routes between routers. So we'll talk about that again coming up. The last kind of forwarding and routing kind of a thing is this thing called a bridge. And, you know, I looked around, bridges kind of have uh, a partial definition. Like there's not this like one true definition of bridges. Um, there are media bridges. And a good example of that is you have a device on one side, it takes say fiber and on the other side of that device, it does ethernet. And what is happening here is the fiber bridge is taking traffic in of, of whatever format it's coming in on the fiber optic line, probably not gonna be an ethernet packet. Uh, it might be an ATM packet, so an ATM cell. It's gonna reassemble those cells into an IP frame and then it's going to re-encapsulate that uh, AP frame and put it out over the ethernet frame. So the bridge is typically not making any decisions. It's just saying, oh, I got data on this interface. I shove it over to that interface. Oh, look, I got data on this interface. I'm gonna shove it over to that interface. And again, we may just go ahead and change the media. Uh, another good example of this is I have at home, I have a Linksys four port switch and wireless. And inside here on the LAN side, it has a bridged network connection to bridge the wireless and the ethernet ports together. Uh, and then it switches between the ethernet ports and it can switch between the wireless traffic and it can route to the WAN port. So I just drew like an alien, hmm, sorry. But anyway, um, that's a good example of one that you probably have where you have wireless and wired networking all together. And so that same device is gonna forward, it's gonna route and it's gonna bridge um, all kind of all together. So why do we even need to route? Like why, why is this technology invented? Well, it turns out that we want to be able to control the growth and management of uh, a network segment. So there are three different kinds of segments that we can have in a network. In the old days, we had one kind of a segment that was called a shared segment. And it was based on some technology called uh, 10 base two. And literally there was a common wire that was run from uh, one end of a building to the other end of a building and that one wire had everybody connected to it. So there were actually these little connectors, they, let's see if I can draw them. They were like little T's in a pipe and you would plug these cables in and then plug that into the back of a PC and everybody saw exactly the same data at exact, well, almost at exactly the same time minus the propagation speed. And as soon as that wire got a break in it somewhere, then everybody went down. Like it wasn't like one guy went down, everybody went down. Terrible networking technology. Um, but shared segment. Well, the other thing, as I mentioned, the speed of light propagating through that wire is a problem. The length of the wire is a problem. The electrical signaling properties of that wire start to degrade as it gets longer and longer and longer. And so, there was a, an upper limit. I, 
I want to say 300 feet and 100 meters, but it, it might be 300 meters and 1,000 feet. I don't remember which. Um, it's been so long and it's not really relevant. There was an upper upper limit though. And so what we ended up doing early on is we made a hub that could have multiple segments coming together. And basically this would just amplify. It didn't do any switching. Um, as far as the hub is concerned, all three of these are connected together internally. Um, and the idea here is I might be able to get away with like if this segment broke, the other two might still be able to talk to each other, but that's about the only, and I got more distance. That's the only advantage that we got from a hub. And finally we saw switches. Um, switches are going to allow us to do that cut through switching or store and forward. If the switch is acting in a store and forward mode, we can actually kind of tamp down the complexity of what's going on on the network wire a little bit, but then we're also adding a more latency for the store and the forward than we did with cut, sw cut through switching. But either way, um, no matter how we look at it, all three of these technologies are um, going to share the media uh, with all the hosts. So in the case of something like Wi-Fi, where we have a whole bunch of Wi-Fi devices and they're all communicating at the same time, obviously the performance is gonna start to fall pretty quickly. And no matter how we shake it, even with a LAN and a bunch of switches and high-speed switches, we're still gonna have too many machines on one local area network. And we're gonna have what's called a collision domain. And in a collision domain, what ends up happening is we have too many hosts trying to send data all at the same time. And the switch can only handle so much and then it starts to degrade. Um, we can get these things called broadcast storms where each machine is sending out data uh, to everybody. So for example, my computer wants to broadcast a message and the switch then has to send it out to 10,000 hosts that's gonna take time and it's going to slow down everybody's segments and increase uh, the number of hosts that are communicating at any given time. Uh, broadcast is bad, multicast can also be bad. Um, I've crashed a switch using multicast before. Uh, hopefully they've fixed that, but anyway. Um, the other problem you can have is a bandwidth mismatch. If I have all of my machines communicating on a gigabit and now I have one machine because of a bad network card communicating at 100 megabit, I can no longer do cut through switching. And so that can really eat away at your performance. And so all of this kind of adds up for, we don't want to treat one large LAN for an entire campus like one large LAN we want to break up uh, segments of the network into administrative domains that we can manage separately, configure separately, control the traffic separately, limit down to the local broadcasts and kind of local messages that need to be exchanged. And like I said, we want to almost treat a local, like a local, local network uh, as if we were a bigger provider, a service provider with multiple customers. Like we want to be able to manage them all separately. And so even on a campus like Shippensburg, we have a router that routes traffic between multiple LAN segments. And that gets us away from this huge one, one huge broadcast domain. It allows us to partition into different subnetworks and for instance, Tim is able to manage our entire subnet uh, completely differently than the rest of campus. And so we can do things that the rest of campus can't do. And um, what the router is gonna do is it's gonna let each of these individual networks communicate when they have to and be independent when they don't have to communicate with one another. And on a micro scale, that's exactly what we wanna see from the rest of the internet. So for example, here in, in the state system of higher education, the 14 state university schools were on a, a shared network. So I don't wanna see Millersville's traffic and Millersville certainly doesn't wanna see our traffic. 
but if I'm talking to Millersville's web server, then I'm gonna need to see their, tra their traffic. And so we're gonna be able to route amongst the 14 state universities differently than we would route to uh, Penn State, even though we're in the same state. Or even if we were to go to um, a .com, because we're on the educational side of the internet. So there's all kinds of routing techniques that we get to take advantage of, um, and we can grow new LAN segments without having to like call up the internet and say, hey, I have a new machine. Um, so routing just allows us to kind of partition things up and manage them a lot more effectively and get control locally where it needs to be. So it turns out that there's really gonna be two criteria for routing um, that we could use. One of which is we could look at using some kind of a unique device ID. And while these device IDs are, at least theoretically, globally unique, um, they don't have any natural structure. So, for instance, if we buy a computer lab, we might get a bunch of network cards from Dell that have the same first numbers because those are assigned to Dell. Um, but then the last numbers, they might come in order, they might be in a range, there might be some missing, but all that's going to tell us is when we bought the computer. So there's no hierarchy, there's no organization to those device IDs. And so we're not really going to be able to use those um, as a tool for getting data through a global internet, or even a local network for that matter. On your own LAN segment they work, just because there's not that many of them. And we can actually just store a table of all of the possible machines on your local LAN segment. Um, and we'll actually take a look at that later on. In a LAN or a WAN environment, um, the LAN may be routing using level two or level three switching. And so when we are looking at um, a local area network, another difference is we might be switching here with ethernet, but then the WAN almost never sees any of that ethernet traffic. It's always gonna be what we call serial data. So it's gonna be over fiber optic or, well, almost always fiber optic or maybe wireless, like, like high density microwave tra uh, towers. And to make, the, make it easier for these WAN networks to find what to do, we're going to assign an address or an internet protocol address to each interface. And that interface that is going to um, be unique so I can't have two machines or two interfaces with the same IP address. And um, IP addresses are hierarchical. So for example, on SHIPS campus, every IP address starts off as 157, 160, and then if it's a 36 through a 38, that means it's in the, the engineering domain. Um, and so I can tell you just by looking at a couple of numbers where the machine is, is and, and who owns it. So routers versus switches. So routers typically don't forward broadcast messages or multicast messages. Routers are only gonna be working at that level three. Um, they're not going to, unless they're configured to, they're not gonna send a, a broadcast message out over there to their next hops. Uh, routers work on level three messages. Switches tend not to. So switches tend to only make decisions based on Ethernet addresses and Ethernet configurations. Switches work with device IDs or interface IDs, um, and they try to build a tree of connected devices. Routers work on IP addresses, and that's a fixed hierarchy of routers, fixed, you know, kind of a map of one router connecting to another router. Um, and then routers typically don't talk directly to all of the PCs on a campus or in, a, in an office. They talk to one switch uplink port and then that switch talks to everybody. So normally when we're talking about routing, there's an implication that somewhere there's also some switches. Um, but again, the switches are gonna be more local, routers are gonna be more wide area network. Leading up to the idea of how do we build a decision for forwarding or not, um, there's two ways that we could do this. Well, three ways really that we could do this. Uh, the first way is through source routing. And in a source routing environment, what's gonna happen is the sender creates a list of destinations that the packet should follow to get to the final destination. So for instance, if I'm on my PC and I wanna to get to your PC, 
I'm going to tell, I'm going to actually, when I send the message, I'm going to send the message to my, my local switch to send it to Sloop, to send it to a router, to send it to another router, to send it to your switch, to your PC. And I've got to know that that route works. Um, it, it feels like nobody would ever use that strategy. Um, and, and I didn't want to like go there too much, but we, we kind of get there with the idea of um, what the, the old way of doing email. Um, there was a protocol called UUCP or Unix to Unix copy protocol. And in Unix to Unix copy protocol, I mean, this is back in the 70s and 80s when there maybe were only 100 machines in the entire internet space. And I would send an, an, an email to a user, Bob, exclamation point, um, host A, exclamation point, host B, exclamation point, um, ship. And what would happen, that would be the email address for Bob. And so what had happened is Bob, like my computer, would look at this and say, do I know how to get to any of those machines? Yep, I know how to get to host B at ship. So I will use my telephone modem and call up host B at ship and say, dude, I have a message for host A, Bob. And then if ship says, oh, I know who you are, we're good to talk. I'll take your message and I'll, I'll send it on to host A. Great. Then we, uh, we disconnect and then ship's modem would call up host A and they would send it to the next hop and eventually deliver it to Bob. I mean, that was source routing and we just don't do that anymore. Um, there's a lot of good reasons for it. I mean, these addresses could change um, as the network architecture around us changes. Like, so the network tends to be much more dynamic than what we would know about. Um, we also have possibly an unbounded length to the packet because I don't know the path that something's gonna take. I mean, it's, in theory, it, I could end up with like 100 to 200 hops to get from me to some distant network connection. And what's really bad then is if I was malicious, I could just make hops that go back and forth to one another just to tie them up and, and kind of screw with things. So source routing isn't really used anymore, um, except for maybe a few special, special purpose circumstances. <clears throat> Another technique for forwarding is called virtual circuits. And in the virtual circuit, what we're going to do is when we open the connection, so you can think back to the TCP example when we did like the connect system call, um, with the operating system could negotiate for us and kind of communicate and say, I want to create this virtual circuit. And we might have to tell the operating system, I need a megabit per second of continuous bandwidth. Um, I need a maximum latency. Um, and so pick a path that will get that to me. And so the operating system would negotiate with its hardware and switching hardware and remote hardware to make that happen or fail. And then once we have that, res that path reserved, um, then what we can do is just start sending data across that path and we would have that bandwidth reserved to us. Um, this idea behind a virtual circuit feels like no one would ever use it, but it actually works really, really well for things like internet over or phone over IP, uh, Netflix kinds of things. Um, we wouldn't want to do this in the general internet, but we might want to be able to do it in a special purpose, special built network, um, especially with uh, like ATM and, and fiber optic connections between things. Um, and finally, what we could do is look at a table of global addresses. And when, in this particular scheme, what we would do is just have general rules for how to get to the next hops. And we will make our, our routing decision based on selecting the next best hop for a given destination at some given point in time. And if we allow those routes to dynamically update based on the network conditions, then as the global internet changes state, the paths between routers tend to change state. For instance, it might be that a router link has gone down. Remember the backhoe? Somebody dug up a line and now we're not talking on those connections anymore. So now we have to find a different route around a dead line. 
maybe we have a, a network storm going on and there's a huge amount of data between two different companies for some reason. Um, maybe there's a misconfiguration in one of the routers somewhere. All of those things happen on a daily basis. And so we want to see that the interfaces dynamically regenerate themselves. Um, they try to reestablish connections. They try to route around bad uh, connections. And um, what will happen then is the routers will kind of automatically come up with the next best route. So the source doesn't know how to get to the destination at all. Like when I send data to Google, I have no idea how it's going to get there. Um, the destination doesn't know how to get back to me. Um, the path that I take to send data to the, the remote side um, may not be the same path that it follows to get back um, as the situation on the ground changes. And so this has proven to be the most, uh, this best effort routing has proven to be the most effective and robust networking technologies we've developed. Um, and it works just because we have a huge number of routes. This would not work if we had a handful of routers, a handful of routes, and a couple of fiber optic cables across the country. There are thousands of fiber optic cables between us and everybody else. Um, and they carry ginormous amounts of data. And that's a technical term. Like that's somewhere between uh, a ton and a metric ton worth of data. So this idea of, of using the best effort works just because there's so much capacity for us to take advantage of. Um, there have been events, by the way, where that decision has failed. Uh, I can remember very vividly uh, 20 some years ago on September 11th, uh, 2001 when uh, the terrorist attack happened the internet itself as everybody turned to look for news sources um, the internet just became unusable um, not just for like us but like across the country um, there it was just too much demand trying to uh, hit at one time um, I'll be honest when we started going through the pandemic and everybody transitioned to working from home and using Zoom, um, I think the, the ability of the global network to handle that huge influx was remarkable. Um, and one that I'm sure there will be some studies coming out of, of how these companies and these communications firms were able to handle that. But again, there's no guarantees. It's just the best effort. So what does this mean for us? So how would we describe the network service model for the internet? And so this is really just telling us what the users of a network can expect. And the services can include guaranteed delivery. So if I send data, it's guaranteed to get there or not. Um, are there upper limits to how long it's gonna take for packets to get there or not? <laughs> Um, if I send three packets ABC, will they arrive ABC or not? Um, are there any bandwidth guarantees? N minimum or maximum or none at all? Um, is there any built-in security or not? <laughs> and I, I keep adding the or not at the end of those because the internet network service model is just a best effort. Um, packets, bandwidth, and latency, none of those are guaranteed. There's no built-in security unless I send it with security. Uh, there's no guarantee on in-order delivery. Um, we just don't know. And we just have this trust and faith that the service providers have negotiated effective agreements and that my data will get to you wherever it's going in a reasonable fashion. And if you think back a few years ago, um, maybe you paid attention to the big debate about network neutrality. Uh, network neutrality was a huge, huge debate where the FCC, so the Federal Communications Commission, I want to say corporation, commission, um, although actually after watching them do network neutrality, maybe, maybe it's a Freudian slip and it really is corporation. Anyway, um, network neutrality says we're gonna treat everybody's packets equally. Um, I'm gonna do my best effort whether you come from my best friend or from my arch rival. So you can see why some of the, com like some of the internet service providers of the world aren't too happy about that. For example, Comcast has a vested interest in its own service and promoting 
its own streaming service over something like, say, Netflix. And so network neutrality bef said that Comcast had to treat Netflix's streams to its customers the same as it treats everybody else's. The FCC has rolled back network neutrality rules, and now Comcast can turn around and either slow down network tra uh, Netflix traffic if it chose to, and, or it could charge Netflix for the privilege of having more preferred access. Maybe uh, they would uh, charge or offer better rates to Hulu and uh, see if they could get more money that way. As customers, we're kind of locked in in this country. We don't have a lot of choice about who provides the, the cable connection to our front door. Um, and so that was one of the big arguments uh, for preserving network neutrality. If there was more competition in the field, then I could say, well, I don't like the fact that Comcast is slowing down Netflix. And I'm not saying that they are. I don't have ev any evidence that they are um, doing this hypothetically. I don't need to be sued. Um, but um, the idea would be that I could just pick a different provider. Um, but the reality is I have Comcast. <laughs> like, um, I don't really have a choice. If I don't like Comcast, I still have Comcast. If I love Comcast, I still have Comcast. So um, in a few cities, there are some, some alternatives, but they're, they're pretty far and few between. Okay, so shifting gears just a little bit, and we'll get to the end of this part one. Um, let's take a, a superficial look at routers and what they do. So the primary function of a router is to read packets from an input port, determine which output port it should go to or drop it, and then <coughs> excuse me, make that forwarding connection. Um, and then provide some kind of command and control protocol to allow the routing tables to be updated. And there, what we're going to see then is as, as traffic comes in, oh, I shouldn't be using blue for that. Let me change colors. So as traffic, I swear I changed colors. Uh, there we go. As traffic comes in and hits this, this uh, switch fabric, one packet could be directed that way, one packet could be directed this way. You have traffic coming in here, one of those could be injected next. And so the switching fabric is going to have the job of trying to pick which is the next packet um, to, to receive from and deliver to. And there are really two way approaches to this. One is the hardware router and the other is the software router. And the hardware router is gonna use custom developed application specific integrated circuits, application specific integrated circuits or an ASIC to implement this switch fabric. And we're gonna see in just a couple slides how Cisco has, has built um, their switching fabric. Um, software routers um, are going to make the, sw the, the, the decision using a for loop. So they're basically going to have to go through and check every port, every rule, every time a packet arrives. And that for loop is going to add s processing time. It doesn't matter how fast your processor is, there's going to be a delay. And one of the questions we're going to have going forward, not just as a class, but as a, as a field, um, are we approaching the end of software routers? So software has to forward packets at 51.2 nanoseconds on a 10 gigabit link to avoid queuing. And so you can imagine if there's a huge data stream coming in here, software cannot handle the 10 gig link. We all have already seen 100 gig links and 1000 gig links. Those cannot be done for high volume uh, streams with software. There, there's just not enough processor power. Um, even the, the switching fabric is gonna be limited um, if you were to just constantly peg data. There has to be some relief for the, those poor packets. Um, so let's take a look. What do I mean by switching decisions? So um, routers are gonna match on patterns for uh, trying to pick whether to, to forward a, uh, a connection or not. And what we're gonna do, um, we haven't really talked about IP addresses, those will be coming up, but
but these are the binary representation of IP addresses. These are 32-bit numbers. And this is what we call tri-state logic, where if it's a 1, it has to match a 1. If it's 0, it has to match a, I'm sorry, a 0. And it, if it's an X, it could be either 1, or what we call a don't care condition. So think of it as a wild card. So let's say that um, I get this uh, connection 1100, 1000000001, whatever, whatever. I want to know which uh, interface should that go to. So what we want to do is check, does it match 1100? It does. Does it, and it, in fact, it matches all three of those. And it matches this one. Uh, 100 matches this one, this one, this one, and this one. So we're still matching all four of those. 001, now well, those are all matches, as well as the wild cards. So now we're looking at 0110. So it matches here, here, uh, those are wild cards, and those are wild cards. Uh oh. Then we're going to look at the 1000, and sure enough, it matches there there, there, and there, and in fact now we can see does it match this as a zero? It does. And then everything else is a wild card, so in the end this one matches all four. I don't want to send this packet out over all four connections though. And so when we have a multiple hit like this, we're going to want to pick the one with the longest pattern match. So let's try a different one. So let's say that we have 11001000000001. One, one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 um, zero, 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 uh, and whatever else. So in this case, we're going to match all of those, right? And we're going to match all of those. But then the zeros, they don't match this whole word here. Um, so the only one that it's going to match now is that interface. And so I would take that, this, a packet with that destination address and send it out to that interface. Um, and if it didn't match any of these, then it's going to match this default. So it's clear this guy here is going to be a default catch-all. And that's how we're going to build all of the routing tables for every device that we ever have on the internet. There's always going to be this kind of series of um, matching these ones and zeros of an address against these kind of patterns and to see what we get, right? Well, how do we do this for real? The way Cisco does it is through something called Content Addressable Memory, or CAM. And what this means is we're not going to ask the memory to give us its value, but we're going to match the value against the search pattern. So what we're going to do is we're going to load the binary values of an IP address into um, the input to this CAM module. And the CAM module has a whole bunch of different patterns that it can match on. And for instance here it says the first bit's a zero. So it doesn't match there, but it does there, it does there, and it doesn't match there. So I don't have to look at those lines ever again, but we'll just keep on going. Um, a one, it does match here, it does match here. I have another one that matches on both of those. I have a zero that matches here, but that's a wild card. That's one of those don't care conditions. It could match a zero or a one. And finally, I have a one and both of those could match. So what I end up with is two possible matches. And what we have here is what looks like a multiplexer, but it's actually called a priority encoder. And what this priority encoder is going to do is it's going to say who was the longest match. If, the, if this guy was the one that happened to match, then he's the longest, he's going to be the, res the return, even if all the rest of them matched. So the fact that these two matched and this guy has a higher priority or a lower number, um, that's going to be the one that this priority encoder picks. So we're only going to get one row out of here. Now, why is this better than a for loop? 
So if this is a for loop, first of all, when was the last time in C language you were able to write a for loop that matched a value in a wildcard? Well, it's tricky, right? So <clears throat> what we can do is have the pattern of values. So I could do this, and then wherever I have x's, put zeros. And what I could do then is take this value, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and mask off wherever there's a wild card. So what I would do is I would mask this thing, so I'd leave these guys on, and these guys off, and then and this together. So 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. And then I can see if these two match. But that's going to be a whole bunch of bitwise operations and some memory operations and an if statement with the branch. And we know that branches are relatively expensive at the machine language because of pipelining. And I have to do the loop overhead and I have to implement the priority encoder and it's just a miserable result. So hardware um, content addressable memory is always going to smoke software. Why? Because it's going to do all of this simultaneously. So uh, Cisco puts at least 512 cells or, or rule rows into every one of their interface matchers. And so you can have a fairly large rule table be matched completely in hardware almost instantaneously. Whereas software, I'm going to have to wait for the for loops and the if statements and all that kind of good stuff. And it's just going to not be as fast. So um, to kind of wrap, wrap this up here, um, we can talk about different kinds of switching technology. Um, Cisco, for example, maintains three different kinds of switches. So we just looked at routers. These are switches. Some of them actually have routers built into them. Um, one kind of switch is the Catalyst 8500 series, and it's using memory. And what happens here is we don't do that virtual circuit, but what we do do is um, we store and forward, but very, very quickly. Um, these have high bandwidth memories, and so they can move data between ports quite rapidly. Um, the, another version of the Cisco technology is the, the Catalyst 9000 series. And here we're going to use um, line cards that share buses. And we can route within a line card in a virtual circuit, or we can route between line cards at a very high rate. This one can do 25.6 terabits per second, um, which is just kind of like, wow, that's fast. <laughs> um, and then finally, they have what we, they call the interconnection network-based models. and. These have a software controlled of parallel network buses that allow um, simultaneous packet switching, but they're not quite as robust and fast as these big core bus-based switches. Um, and so um, they'll add additional software functionality for doing things like um, intrusion detection and stuff like that. So we've already talked about queuing theory, and so I don't want to go too much deeper into it, but we do have to talk about it one more time um, in the form of switching and, and forwarding. So um, network congestion, as we saw before, is going to cause queues to fill, router delays are going to happen and add to that congestion, and the ultimate results are the same. We have a very unhappy user. Um, we're going to start dropping packets. And in the case of TCP, that's going to cause a bunch of retransmissions. In the case of UDP, it's going to be missed messages. So what we look at is something called head-of-line blocking, and this is what we really want to avoid. Head-of-line blocking occurs when we have um, output ports that are available and they're not being used, and I have um, some contention on the head of line um, and I can't release the next packet because there's contention for that port. So, you know, here we can see port three is not being used. Um, no one's using it, but I have at least one frame here stalled because it's trying to talk to port number four. 
And so there's a couple of different ways that we can try to deal with this. One is we can just make it faster. So we can have um, port four, if that's really the source of contention, maybe it needs to be a 10 gigabit link instead of a one gigabit link. Or maybe the computer system that is using, or that is that server or whatever the hotspot is, can be split up over multiple interfaces um, to help uh, some of that congestion. Or we can just try to design the network around that congestion in the first place. So one thing we can do is make sure that we have adequate buffer sizes so that we're not dropping frames. And we can do that by just using some very basic statistics. So here we can say the buffer size in bits should be the round trip time of the data in the switch times the link bandwidth. So if the round trip time is 250 milliseconds and it's a 10 gigabit link, then we need to have 2.5 times 10 to the eighth bytes per port. Um, that seems like an awful lot. It really comes out to about uh, 256 megabytes worth of RAM per port, but that might be on a 48 port switch and that gets a little absurd. For TCP connections, where it's kind of a large number of connections, but the individual traffic flows are a lot lighter, then we can get away with some smaller and smaller windows. And what we look at here is taking the number of connections um, as, a uh, as a denominator into the connection speed. Um, Another way around the queuing problem is just to get better at scheduling. And so there's a number of different scheduling algorithms. And I know operating systems is not a prereq for this course, but when you take operating systems, we look at scheduling algorithms there as well. It's similar to what we see in operating systems, but there's a big difference. Here we don't have any process blocking. Um, like I'm not having one process wait for another process. I mean, we were waiting for the interface, but that's about it. And there's no starvation. Like I'm not locking up resources and dealing with race conditions. So we could look at a first in first out approach. Um, so as um, we give every, the arrival rate is gonna determine who comes out. Um, that's nice starvation free, but it doesn't necessarily let me get to the bandwidth requirements that I might need. We can look at priority types of scheduling and what we're gonna do there is assign a priority to each kind of message somehow through some magic. And we're gonna pick the highest priority message out of the queue. Um, we can do round robin where what we'll do is we'll have a, a queue for each service class. So instead of doing it by port number or by interface number, we'll have like TCP port number 80 gets to be one service class and uh, that's the web service. And this port gets to be that service class. And I wanna give that service class more precedence than this service class. So I'll try to pick more packets out of that queue than others. And that actually kind of leads you right into the weighted fair queuing. So we're always gonna pull packets out like we did in round robin, but with a bandwidth attached to their priority as well. So anyway, we can schedule packets, that's all in the book. I'm not gonna reread the book for you there. Um, the one thing that is really interesting is that we can look at the 11 different fields that can be used as determinants for a match. And so um, the router can look at the interface that the, the datagram came in on or the packet came in on. It's link, layer two MAC addresses and type some things called VLANs, which we haven't seen yet, but we'll see in the next chapter or two chapters. We can look at the IP addresses, the protocol, whether it's TCP or UDP. Um, we can look at the um, type of service it is. And then we can look at um, port numbers for source and dest. And with those in mind, we can either forward the packet on to uh, the rule interface that we've defined we can drop it or we could even rewrite this thing. And so we might come in and say, well, packet for that destination actually gets rewritten to some other destination. And the more aggressive that we get at doing this, the closer and closer we get at merging two different kinds of devices, one called a firewall, which is used to intentionally drop packets that match certain rules um, with routing decisions. And so the kind of the gold standard now is we want to merge those two functions together. Um, 
or not, just depends on your architecture. I do think it's always interesting that with just a handful of um, elements, we can look at a match or not a match. All right, so this is right at one hour. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up and we will pick up in part two with the internet protocol. Thank you.